Uh, thank you for coming to CSIS. My name is Jim Lewis. We have uh, two panels to talk about the Cloud Act, which I don't know about you, but at least I was fairly confident when I went to bed the night before the budget bill that it would be months before we saw the Cloud Act and then woke up the next morning to find out I was completely wrong. And so we were lucky to have uh, two people who said, gee, maybe we should have an event on it and talk about what, uh, what uh, the implications are. This is something if the, the Cloud Act in general captures uh, or hopefully achieves a goal that I think people have been looking at for probably about two decades now of how we can streamline uh, transborder law enforcement cooperation in a way that respects uh, constitutional rights but doesn't um, impede the course of investigations any more than necessary. To discuss that, or discuss really whatever they want, um, we're going to have two panels. The first panel, I'm going to introduce the moderators to the panels, and then they'll introduce the speakers. The first panel will be uh, moderated by David Bitkower, who's a partner at Jenner and Block, and of course most of you know him as the former Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division at DOJ. Uh, so we're lucky to have him here. It's a very long bio, so I'm not going to read it, but we will have it on the website. <laughs> okay, well, starting in, uh, starting in the early 70s. <laughs> in kindergarten. Born on a mountain, yeah. Um, the second panel will be uh, moderated by uh, Jen Daskal, uh, a senior resident here, uh, non-resident uh, fellow at CSIS, um, one of our cyber fellows. And from, uh, with a background, now of course a professor of law at American University, and prior to that from the National uh, Security Division at the DOJ, along with other, many other things. So I feel like we have our bases covered. We have criminal division and, and NSD. What more could you need for a discussion <laughs> of the Cloud Act? But with that, uh, let me turn it over to David. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um, so first of all, just very, very grateful to the Center for Strategic International Studies and to Jim uh, in particular for putting this on. Less than two weeks after the legislation has passed, I think this is hopefully setting a new record for, for quick reactions to what could be groundbreaking legislation um, uh, to, to discuss it with, with a real collection of people who know uh, all about the different areas that we're going to be getting into. Uh, as Jim said, we're going to have two panels. The first panel focuses on what is really sort of part one of the Cloud Act, which we'll talk about in a second. And the second panel, which Jen will be hosting and moderating, is the focus on the part two of the Cloud Act relating to international agreements uh, to facilitate cross-border data access. The panel we have here for part one is going to focus on what investigations look like under the Cloud Act, how do conflicts of law uh, arise, and how will they be handled on, under the Cloud Act's provisions relating to international comedy and the like. Uh, and where will the flashpoints be in the future? So we've assembled a panel of three folks who can cover different aspects of that and hopefully we'll get a good conversation going. Um, so what I'm gonna do is first introduce the three panelists, say a couple words just to set the table about what the Cloud Act does and then turn it over to my, to my guests here to, to start hashing it out. So first on the video screen, I'll start with Kelly who's above and to the side here. Uh, Kelly Hagedorn is a, is a partner at General Block in their London office. Um, Kelly, um, Kelly's practice focuses on cross-border uh, white-collar investigations uh, and compliance, and she also advises clients on data privacy rules and in particular on the uh, GDPR. Uh, before joining General Block, Kelly worked at another global law firm and also did a secondment at the Serious Fraud Office uh, in London as well. So she's got experience on both the enforcement side as well as on the defense side. Um, to my left, uh, Alex Berengo is a partner at Covington and Burling here in DC. Um, Alex represents clients also in both enforcement and civil matters with a focus on cross-border issues, um, electronic surveillance and data privacy, but probably most relevant to this panel. In particular, Alex is one of the attorneys at, at Covington and Burling who represented Microsoft in the case, in the Microsoft Ireland case, uh, which as of yesterday, I suppose, may be, may be mooted um, by the passage of the Cloud Act. And so Alex brings a real expertise in the issues that led to that case coming up as well as it led to this legislation being passed. And then to my far left is Sandra Mosier, who is the acting chief of the fraud section at the Justice Department's criminal division. Uh, in that capacity, Sandra supervises over 100, 150 now prosecutors. 
Yeah, I didn't yes. know if you were going to say cases of prosecutors. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thousands of yes. cases. Yes. <laughs> 150 or so prosecutors who conduct the largest, highest profile cross-border investigations in the Justice Department. And so Sandra has either prosecuted or supervised or otherwise been involved in probably most of the major cross-border cases that folks have heard of in the last five years, including the cases involving the LIBOR rate-fixing scandal, the foreign exchange cases, uh, the Volkswagen prosecution, uh, every single FCPA prosecution in America, and the like. So Sandra brings a real expertise to how the government functions in cross-border investigations, uh, more generally, not just in the context of the Stored Communications Act. Prior to her time at the Criminal Division, Sandra was an assistant US attorney uh, in the District of New Jersey. Uh, and prior to that was at Morgan Lewis in Philadelphia. So with, with these three panelists, hopefully we're going to be able to address a lot of the issues that are raised by the Cloud Act and how it affects cross-border investigations. So what I want to do just for, for two minutes before we start asking questions is just to make sure we're all dealing with a common vocabulary is to focus on three things that part one of the Cloud Act does before Jen and the second panel get to part two of the Cloud Act. So the Cloud Act, by its terms, uh, addresses the issue that came up in the Microsoft Island case, which is specifically, can the Justice Department or another prosecutorial entity in the United States compel a provider to produce records that may be stored outside the United States? And the Cloud Act, in one of its uh, principal sections, unequivocally and unambiguously says, yes, the government can compel a provider to provide those records uh, no matter where they're stored, in the United States or not stored in the United States. It then has two provisions to deal with the possibility for conflicts of laws that may result in light of that sort of uh, compulsion authority. One of those provisions is a statutory, express statutory, express statutory provision, uh, 18 U.S.C. 2703H, and that provides that if a conflict of laws arises with what is called a qualifying foreign government, which we'll get to in a second, and the conflict does not relate to a person in the United States or United States person, then there's a very particular procedural mechanism set forth for handling that potential conflict of laws. A provider is able to raise it in a certain manner within a certain amount of time, and a court must consider certain factors in deciding whether in the totality of the circumstances and the interest of justice, the warrant ought to be modified or quashed. So that relates to that set of circumstances where there is not a US person, not a person in the United States, and it's a qualifying foreign government, which means, as the second panel will explore, it's a government that has in agreement with the United States to facilitate cross-border data access. Currently, of course, there are no such governments. And as the second panel will discuss in greater detail, it may be some time before there are such governments. And it's not clear yet which governments will be in that category. For all other potential conflicts of laws that may arise as a result of a Stored Communications Act warrant, the statute effectively says the statute makes no change to whatever common law right a provider may have to move to quash or modify that warrant on the basis of common law comedy considerations. So the statute doesn't say that there is a common law analysis available. It doesn't say that there's not one. It says it preserves whatever the law was prior to the enactment of the statute. And so that applies right now in 100% of cases where there may be conflicts. But that may change over time if and when international agreements come online. So we're going to focus on both of those aspects here. And our goal now is to talk about two weeks into the Cloud Act, what will investigations look like and what will they look like going forward? So the first person I want to turn to on this is, is Kelly in London and say, so Kelly, you practice obviously um, uh, at an American law firm, but of course uh, in London and you're, uh, you're trained and expert in European law, in particular British law, as well as in the in GDPR, which is coming online very soon. So Kelly, can you talk a little bit about how do you expect conflicts could or might or could arise under the Cloud Act? Uh, what scenarios are they most likely to arise? Um, and is that going to change when GDPR comes into effect? So thanks, David. Um, I, if it's all right, will major heavily on GDPR and less heavily on the kind of law pre-GDPR. Uh, the reason for that being that GDPR comes into force across the entire EU on the 25th of May. So we are looking at a five-week window before that. Um, kicks off. Um, but the important thing to note is that both pre and post GDPR transfers of personal data out of the European economic area to third countries of which the US is one are difficult. Um, and unless you have specific exemptions, you just can't do it as a company. So um, pre, pre GDPR, certainly under English law, is a little bit easier. Um, the Data Protection Act has specific carve-outs that allow you to 
process data, which would include moving it um, out of the EEA if you're doing so for national security reasons or if you are trying to prevent or detect crime or to allow the apprehension or prosecution of offenders. So um, I think what we have seen in the past is a lot of um, providers who have personal data based in the European economic area have relied on those exemptions to allow the data to be pushed out to the US. Um, post GDPR, it all becomes a bit more difficult and a lot more uncertain. Um, we are still in a phase where we have very little guidance from the European Commission. Uh, we have very little guidance from the data protection authorities in the individual member states. Um, so we are really kind of stuck with reading the GDPR itself. Um, and just to, to take it back to kind of first principles, if you are a data controller, so you are somebody who has personal data about individual people based in the European economic area, you have to process that personal data, which includes anything from storing it, transferring it, uh, deleting it, collecting it in the first place. You have to do that in compliance with six key principles. And the most important of those for the purposes of today's discussion are that you can only process personal data lawfully, fairly and transparently, um, and that you must collect that personal data for specified purposes and that you can't process it in different and incompatible ways. So you can see that already that's going to cause potentially some problems. When we're talking about lawful processing, that, that has a very specific meaning under the GDPR. There are six grounds that make processing, including transferring data to another person, lawful, five of which just on their face do not apply to this situation where a provider has got a warrant from the DOJ. One that might apply is um, legitimate interest. So as a data controller, you are allowed to process personal data if you have legitimate interests, such as, one might say, um, not being subject to legal action in the United States for failing to comply with a warrant. So you might think that's the panacea. Well, it kind of isn't because that, uh, as always, comes with a caveat. Your legitimate interests as a provider must not be overridden by the interests and fundamental freedoms of a data subject. So um, if the data subject's got a fundamental right to keep the data in the EEA and you have a legitimate interest in pushing it out of the EEA to the US, where's the balance and who wins? And at the moment, we don't know. Um, that's all before you even get to the prohibition on moving personal data out of the EEA to the US. And when you get there, there is an absolute prohibition on moving personal data out of the European economic area unless you have particular um, conditions that are met. So most of these are completely inapplicable. Um, if you've got a, um, an adequacy decision handed down by the European Commission, so countries like Argentina and the Faroe Islands are considered to have equivalent data protection legislation, and you can move data backwards and forwards there, no problem. The US does not have that. Um, you can put in place contractual safeguards, but that typically only works within corporate groups or within uh, between two different companies. That's not going to work here because you're talking about transferring data to a government. Um, or if you've got a judgment of a country like the US, that has been recognized pursuant to um, an international agreement, you can transfer the data. So if the warrant went through an MLAT procedure, then you would be permitted to transfer the data out of the EEA to the US. But here, my understanding is we're not talking about going through an MLAT process. We're talking about the US Department of Justice issuing a warrant and sending it straight to the provider in the European economic area and then being required to push the data back. Um, so thus far, we have not found in our exploration of the GDPR a way to get there. There are two fallback derogations that might work. Um, if you've got public interest, you can transfer data out of the EEA. Or if there are compelling legitimate interests, you can transfer the data out of the EEA. But those are going to be interpreted strictly, we think. Um, and as yet, as I say, we have no guidance. Um, 
we don't have any cases from the Court of Justice yet to um, interpret what those two uh, fallback derogations mean. Um, and so on its face, we are presented, I think, with a situation where you have a very real risk that as a uh, provider responding to a warrant issued under the Cloud Act is going to put you in potential breach of the GDPR. Well, that, that's great, Kelly. So let me, let me turn it over to Alex then, because obviously you advise providers. Obviously, you were involved in the Microsoft litigation itself. And that's a case where uh, no confidence had been alleged in the litigation itself. But now we have a, the case where a new warrant has been issued in the Microsoft case, and, and obviously in other cases that are like that. Under the Cloud Act, then, should we expect based on what Kelly has said about the GDPR and, and your experience, are there going to be a lot more conflicts now than there were two weeks ago? Yeah, I think that's, that's, uh, that's really one of the key questions coming out of the passage of the Act. I think in, in answering, though, it's um, worth taking a step back and talking about the two different categories of countries that you mentioned in your summary, because there are countries that have an executive agreement under the kind of part two of the act, which we'll be talking about during the second panel, um, and the rest of the world. And right now, everyone fits in the rest of the world bucket. But I think the idea is that it is in the interest of the United States government and um, our foreign partners to create these agreements with countries that satisfy the objective metrics in the Cloud Act and in the agreements themselves that will be negotiated. Once you have countries that enter into those agreements, uh, as you said, that means that there is this uh, statutory comedy framework that is created by the Cloud Act that will govern challenges that a provider wants to bring in the presence of a, of a risk of conflict. But uh, I think equally importantly from the provider perspective is the goal of the Cloud Act is that you would never have to actually use those comedy challenge mechanisms because one of the provisions of the Cloud Act requires that one of the criteria for entering into an agreement with a foreign country is that that country will lift whatever bars it currently has that would otherwise block a US provider from complying with US process. So I think the thought is, uh, to the extent this is an issue, it is uh, a short term issue because in the longer term, you will have these agreements which will provide the vehicle for the mitigation of conflicts um, for US providers responding to US process. So the agreements are not just limited in their effect to facilitating the ability of foreign governments to access data from US providers, although that's obviously an important uh, purpose they serve. So that's, that's I think, the longer term uh, objective and, and framework. But you're right that it doesn't address the immediate term issue of what to do when you have a, um, a request that bears on the equities of a country that does not have one of these agreements. Um, and it's a, it's a decision that I think the providers will have to figure out in the post-Cloud uh, Act world. Uh, one interesting feature of that, of that decision is that there's not just uncertainty about how the GDPR is going to be implemented. There's also, I think, um, some disagreement and discussion about what the content of the comedy analysis would be under the common law. Um, and I think that's a question that's left open by the Cloud Act, as you say, because although it creates a statutory framework for qualifying foreign governments, for every other country in the world, um, it leaves in place whatever the status quo is. And there are not a lot of cases that analyze what that, what that status quo would right. be. So maybe that's a good place to start. Let's walk through. So let's imagine a new case arises tomorrow. DOJ serves a warrant on a provider for data stored in, you know, somewhere in, in the European, you know, say, let's say Italy, to make it not Ireland, for example. Um, what is the next step? What does the provider do? What, do they, what questions do they have to answer for themselves? And then what does that analysis look like in uh, federal court? Well, I think that the, the, there, are no, there are no cases that apply a comedy analysis to Stored Communications Act legal process. Um, there, are a, there are a body of cases that, that do that analysis with respect to um, civil discovery requests in the context of a civil litigation, including some Supreme Court law um, that some of the amici in the Microsoft case focused on pretty heavily. There are also cases that analyze international comedy in the context of government legal demands and criminal investigations that fall outside the Stored Communications Act. So forget about a provider like Microsoft or Google. It's just a traditional criminal investigation without 
the, uh, the cloud dimension to it, and the government seeks evidence from a witness using a grand jury subpoena. The witness says, my bank records are stored in the Cayman Islands in bank secrecy law there bars me from producing the bank records. In those types of cases, courts have conducted a comedy analysis, and they've looked at many of the same factors that the Cloud Act discusses, including how important is this evidence to the US government investigation? Um, are there available alternative mechanisms, which um, is an important feature of the analysis and also feeds back into one of the issues that was litigated in the Microsoft case, which is what is the significance of the fact that there is an MLAT with Ireland, and if the government wanted to, it could have obtained the evidence that was sought in the case through that, through that channel. Um, and then one of the considerations is the conflict that the provider would face and exposure and penalties it would face under foreign law. So I think all of those considerations right. would have to be part of the analysis. And for, for both you and Kelly, before I, before I bring Sandra to the conversation, um, is there a consideration? So under the statutory mechanism, there is a particular standard that you have to show material risk of a conflict of law. Under the common law analysis, I take it that's much less clear as to what a provider would have to show to get the, the, the judge to actually look at the, whether there is a conflict and whether to have a common analysis or not. Is there a consideration when you're advising a client that is, how strongly do you want to aver the existence of a conflict? I take it this was sort of in the background of the Microsoft case but didn't come to the fore, and, but could come to the fore of the next case. That is, would you want a client, whether it's a provider or another company subject to a warrant, to say there is a conflict with European law or is there a, a more nuanced approach you can take that doesn't get you into trouble in the European jurisdiction, but that gets you over the bar to get the judge in America to take notice and potentially quash a, a warrant issued by a judge. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important consideration. And actually, during the oral argument in the Second Circuit, I think it was Judge Lynch who said, look, you're not, you're not alleging that doing this would violate Irish law. And I can understand why you wouldn't want to do that, because that's effectively making a concession that could expose your client to liability in a foreign jurisdiction. And I think that's one important reason why, in the statutory comedy analysis, the Cloud Act requires the provider to only, to get in the courthouse door with one of these comedy challenges, all they have to say, all they have to establish is that there's a, quote, material risk of a conflict. Um, but as you say, in the common law, there is, uh, that, that's something that's subject to disagreement. I think the providers would say that the standard is the same, that all they have to do is argue that there's a risk. Um, but I, I think the department has a different view of that. Kelly, do you want to weigh in on that? I, all I would say is that I think it would be a very brave uh, European lawyer at this stage who would uh, make any definitive statements about what would or would not breach the GDPR. Um, I think the best that anybody could come up with uh, from this side of the pond is that there is a, a risk, um, and some might say a fairly substantial risk, that uh, complying with a Cloud Act warrant would breach the GDPR. Um, but I, I don't think anybody could be that categoric um, at this stage when it's not come into force yet. We have no um, case law to help us interpret the provisions of Article 49 and the, the derogations for public interest, et cetera. So I want to go to Sandra now because, so we're talking now about a common law comedy analysis, at least until we have agreements. Um, that every case falls in that common law category. And even when there are agreements, every case outside of that circle of, of nations with agreements will fall into that common law category. And so one of the reasons I think uh, Sandra can contribute to this is because in, in, in non-Stored Communications Act contexts, that's not that unusual. That is to say, it's quite common for the Justice Department to seek records that are stored abroad when it's investigating corporate entities, and they have records stored all around the world. And production of those records pursuant to a grand jury subpoena in this case could result in many of the same conflicts with many of the same European uh, data privacy regulations. So Sandra, can you, can you walk us through a little bit how, um, as, a, as, a, as a white collar investigator and prosecutor, how often do these issues come up? And how are they dealt with, at least in the case where the data holder is the subject of the investigation? Bear in mind that might be a different scenario where the data holder is a disinterested third party provider. Right, and I think that that's an important point to make in terms of my helpfulness <laughs> to inform this audience on, on anything Cloud Act related, which is there, there is, um, as a threshold matter, often a divergence when you're talking about the situation that gave rise to the passage of uh, the Cloud Act, which is a provider and um, 
the terminology of them as sort of a disinterested third party may or may not be correct. I don't know. And um, your client uh, may yeah, have, their, have their own views of that, Alex. But I can tell you that the situations where I most encounter it in the white collar uh, prosecutorial world, you're dealing with entities that are not so disinterested. They are the subjects or can be targets of the uh, investigation. And therefore, if they are in a cooperative posture, they are motivated in potentially a very different way than a provider might be to find a way to get the Department of Justice or whatever arm it is that's investigating them, uh, the information that they seek. Some certainly more motivated than others um, that within the scope of wanting to be cooperative. And, and that's what I, I, I found one point that we were just discussing sort of um, interesting about whether you need to aver that there's an actual conflict going in under these different, whether the statutory regime or going in for uh, common law, comedy analysis. I find it interesting in my world where there's often not an actual legal process served. You, you deal amazingly um, to, to many um, who become familiar with white collar with sort of a voluntary situation, um, sometimes for years of an investigation, which, which comes as a surprise to many. So there might not be an actual legal process. It can be um, a request and a dialogue for this sort of information. But I've found that in that context, that there is often much more of a willingness on the part of the entity, even under investigation, to come in and uh, aver that there is an actual conflict of law. And I find that to be ironic, because often that is an entity that is similarly situated to several other entities that are coming before, uh, for me, the fraud section, the, very, the, the same part of the DOJ. And they are all taking a different approach. So it, it, it always amazes me that one can come in and say, uh, you know, concretely, there's an actual conflict of law in the UK based on this sort of information that you're asking for, or Germany, or Switzerland, or France. Um, but yet another financial institution, for example, will come in and say, no problem, you know, we have a way that we can get you the information. So let's focus on that for a second. So you're dealing with, in this case, four or five banks, let's just say, in the same investigation. Sure. And you might have three banks saying, uh, your data request conflicts with European, fill in the blank, European country data privacy law, and two banks are saying, here's the data. Yes. And so how do, how do you deal with that situation? Well, um, and maybe I'm overstating uh, the fact that, that the two of the three say, here it is. It's generally sure. not quite, quite <laughs> that simple, right? But um, the way that we deal with it, I mean, it's, whether it's the common law comedy analysis, whether they're the factors that are now laid out in... Um, uh, in, the, in the section H, the subsection H of the Cloud Act um, to potentially be examined down the road. Um, we're looking at many of the same sort of things, um, just in a more informal context in, in communicating with um, an entity that we are investigating. And uh, we're asking ourselves, sorry, those questions um, that are common sense. Is there another source? Um, and. and if there's not, or there's not one that's readily apparent, and often we need the company or entity to, to help us figure that out, um, what laws are actually implicated? Um, what, what are the real limitations or, not loopholes, but um, uh, you know, availability to um, get around those limitations um, by examining them? And really, we do place the burden on entities um, to come forth, whether it's via a white paper or another uh, form of presentation, to do a very thorough analysis of, of the law that they may be invoking as preventing them from providing something. Because not nor I, um, nor the many, many prosecutors that work in the fraud section cannot be experts um, in uh, all of the different data privacy regimes and different types of blocking statutes that exist in countries around the world where we do investigations, FCPA, securities fraud, other, um, other cross-border investigations. So we do place the burden on the company to come in and explain to us in great detail and walk through whether they're the, the principles of um, the, the DPA in the UK, as we've been dealing with uh, for many years now, or, or some other regime, to really take a deep dive and try to understand what's preventing you or what's not. And you can believe that the, the one institution that's saying, 
absolutely not. There's just no way we can do this. We're going to be, you know, fined and, and, and subject to all of these risks. They're going to, we're going to have to engage in a much more in-depth uh, dialogue and conversation and sort of hot bench approach with them um, to, to get to the root of that. Right. So, so let, let's take that problem, I guess, and maybe multiply it by a, a few orders of magnitude, because you're talking about the fraud section, yes. which is one cohesively run and managed section which Thank you're in you. charge of. Uh, <laughs> right? but, and, and a few, of course, and a few, I'll take that. And a few <laughs> you know, other US attorney's offices that, around the country that deal with these sorts of large right. cross-border cases. But now we're talking about every SCA warrant in America issued by both federal and state authorities. And I, th some, I think Will was saying there's 18,000 prosecutorial entities now in America, or investigative and prosecutorial entities in America, who might be interested in getting data stored that might be stored anywhere. Um, should we expect, and, and I'll turn to Alex and Kelly on this question, but should we expect that is to say, um, how are they going to handle potentially differing responses from a host of different providers opining about the same statute, the same GDPR, or the same local data protection law in the UK, France, Switzerland, fill in the blank, um, are we going to ex should, should providers expect to have to have coherent answers to an array of different authorities asking for the same kind of data that implicates the same kind of laws? And then, you know, and, and to the extent of, Sandra, I know this is not necessarily your area, but if you can even hazard a guess or an estimation, that is, is that going to be something that DOJ looks at in a coherent manner, or will SDNY push back in an area where EDVA might be satisfied, or the fraud section will say no, but the antitrust section will say yes. Um, how, does this, how does this multiplicity of analyses take place? Start with you, okay. Alex. <laughs> um, it, it's true that, and it's one of the issues that we identified in the litigation, that even though the department is in a position to um, have a cohesive approach with respect to international data, cross-border data requests, and to have the benefit of the State Department's coordinate role in managing foreign affairs, that's, that's not a function and role in our system that state and local law enforcement agencies have. So it's definitely a challenge. I, I think that um, the fact that providers might not necessarily answer the question the same way about the data privacy risk in any particular case is probably to be expected and is a product really of the, the analysis itself. I mean, the analysis is very case dependent. In any particular case, the, many of the factors are already going to be different, irrespective of the position the provider takes about exposure under foreign uh, data privacy law. And many providers, as the Microsoft case illustrated, have different network architectures that will probably, in turn, shape their data privacy risk in, in different jurisdictions. I mean, I will say, with respect to Microsoft, the, the, the risk presented by or GDPR, foreign data privacy risk, that's presented by investigations from state and local entities um, is, is perhaps not as large of an issue as might be feared, because Microsoft um, as part of its effort to maintain um, good quality of service for customers, stores customer information um, proximate to the user's location. And so if you expect, and I think it's probably... Is it their, it's their self-identified location, though, right? No, or it's actually... Their... I mean, so at, at the start of the case, um, now years ago, um, that was the way it, it worked. But um, since then, as part of an ongoing effort to try to limit network latency of the amount of time that the, the messages have to travel back and forth to the server, right. Microsoft has a process of trying to figure out you know, what's the most efficient location to store data for a particular user. And that, that is, um, uh, has, has been rolled in over the last couple of years. And so I think for state and local law enforcement investigations, where you, I think, can expect that the investigation is probably going to be more local in its focus, I think this, this issue might not tend to arise with as much frequency. Right, right. And so, and one other issue to, just to put on the table, and, and folks can weigh in or not, but when we talk about the common law um, common analysis that applies for other types of cases, uh, for grand jury subpoenas, for bank records overseas and the like, which both Alex and Sandra have referred to, in, the Justice Department has a process now where if a prosecutor wants to seek such records and it would cause the recipient to violate foreign law, that can't be issued by just a local AUSA on their own. That has to be analyzed and reviewed by the Office of International Affairs and a high-ranking DOJ official. 
it remains an open question, of course, whether that process would apply to the SCA. Right. And I mean, for Bank of Nova Scotia subpoenas, exactly. there is, there's, of course, a, there, well, it's not a course. It's, for, for me, it's an of course. <laughs> there's, there's certainly a process, and that involves our Office of International Affairs, because there's a recognition that there's a, there's a tension there. And that is true whether you're an assistant U.S. attorney that's sitting in Madison, Wisconsin, or whether you're, you're sitting in the fraud section. Um, so, uh, you know, it, my, my friends and colleagues on the second panel may know more or may have, be in a better position um, given uh, their roles to surmise whether everything will uh, play out in the same way. But speaking as just myself, uh, I, I would like to think so. But the fact that the Stored Communications Act or this, the ability to seek this sort of information is not cabined to the Department of Justice. Uh, you know, by definition, means there will there can be no ultimate consistency. Right. I would imagine um, if it's a tool that, of course, uh, continues to be used as I imagine it will be by local law enforcement as well. Right. So I want to leave some time for questions, but I want to throw one last question out to the panelists, which is: so we've talked about a lot of open questions um, under Part One of the Cloud Act before we even get to Part Two of it. Um, so. One way to think about it, and a lot of the news coverage, I think, in the light of the Cloud Act and, and the mooting of the Microsoft case, one way to think about it is we've answered a lot of questions, and although the litigation itself might have been at least adversarial in nature, at least in terms of what played out in court, um, this, this is a bill that was supported by both providers as well as the Justice Department. And so one way to think about it is you might expect that now there will be a more cooperative spirit going forward. On the other hand, as we've identified, it may just be now that the, a barrier to conflicts has been lowered, and there's an opportunity for many more conflicts to arise than, than existed even before. So should we expect then, now that Microsoft One is no longer, is there likely to be a Microsoft Two tomorrow that has to go up to the Supreme Court as well to determine, is there a common law comedy analysis available under the SCA? What does that analysis look like? What do you have to avert to get over the threshold to establish such a conflict, to have a judge analyze the comedy fa factors in the first place? All of the issues we've just been talking about do these have to be litigated as well, given that it's going to be at least six months at a minimum before there's a, a single qualifying foreign government and likely many years more before there's a host of them enough to reduce these conflicts? What's, what's next on the horizon? More litigation or more negotiation? If you guys can take your crystal balls out, I'd be interested to hear what your thoughts are. Well, the, again, this this is true. Uh, this is not even a crystal ball. This is just sort of spitballing. <laughs> a spitball, but, yeah. I mean, I would say, just look at, for me, just approaching it as a lawyer, prosecutor, whatever, any, anything that involves a sort of totality of the circumstances, and you look at the, the factors that play into examining Bank of Nova Scotia or you know, the common law comedy analysis, and then you look at the factors um, that are listed in, in now the Cloud Act, and I just consider the factors and the sort of round and round that I go through with companies, again, trying to cooperate in the many different ways at which they, they try to um, in an endeavor to be helpful or you know uh, to benefit themselves also provide the information I mean there I wouldn't say the only limit is their own ingenuity but we've seen lots and lots of, of different things and so when you're in that sort of world of balancing these um, truly competing uh, priorities um, and, and against the backdrop of an ever strengthening sort of European view of data privacy and their view um, of America as not being uh, nearly protective enough of, of those interests. It's hard for me to see how certainly this is not going to be uh, litigated uh, down the line to try to, and, and that there will not necessarily be, I would imagine, one consistent body of law associated right. with it. Right. Alex Kelly? I would, just following on from what Sandra says, I think that um, you used to find it, it relatively easy to advise as a lawyer um, that you would take a risk-based approach. You would go and give the data to the DOJ, even if you thought really on a strict analysis of the data protection laws, um, that would be a breach because you're more frightened of the DOJ than you are of the relevant data protection authority, just in terms of pure numbers, frankly. Um, I think that's changing a lot. And I think that lawyers um, in the EU will not really want to take the risk um, of advising somebody to disclose information to the US in circumstances where they cannot be sure that it's not going to breach GDPR because you could be exposing your client to um, a fine of up to 4% of worldwide turnover. 
Uh, do I want that on my professional indemnity uh, insurance risk? Mm, probably not. Um, so I think that makes this, this, the advising part much harder as a lawyer. Um, but I do think that it is quite clear, sort of just, I, can't, I wouldn't presume to advise about the, uh, the US um, court situation, but certainly on an international basis, I think it's very clear that the EU and the member states within the EU um, have as a priority the fight against international crime and terrorism. Um, I think that they would want to work with the US in a way that allows the effective cross-border transfer of data to um, help in that fight. Um, and I think if that means as a provider, you need to go and speak to the data protection authority in the relevant jurisdiction, be that the information commissioner's office in the UK or or the relevant one in Ireland or, or Germany or France, my suspicion is that you would find um, a welcome there. Or you would find somebody who was uh, prepared to talk to you sensibly. If you are a good corporate citizen that has genuinely competing um, obligations to protect the personal data, but also to disclose it, uh, I, I would hope and expect that those data protection authorities will take a sensible and proportionate approach to the interpretation of the GDPR to allow all of the policy considerations to be considered. Uh, yeah, I think from my perspective, it comes back to what your, your question you raised about whether providers are disinterested um, third parties in relation to these investigations we've been talking about and whether they're similar or dissimilar in that respect from the witness or subject in a white collar investigation. From my perspective, I think they're they're both. I mean, there, there is a respect in which providers are disinterested, and that is an important feature of their role when they receive legal process. And I think this was true before the Warren case, true before the Cloud Act, and it's true after the Cloud Act, that, that they analyze each piece of legal process. And there are a lot of times where there will be uh, pushback, or even in some instances, litigation, many of which hasn't been as high profile as, as the Microsoft Ireland case. And I think the companies view that as part of their obligation to protect their customer data and only disclose it when they, are, uh, they truly believe there's a legal obligation to do so. In another sense, I think they are very interested in the outcome of, of what happens next because over the long term, as I mentioned, really the only way I think we can systematically mitigate these risks in both, in both directions is to facilitate the um, entering into of these agreements. And it's true it won't happen in the next couple of months, and GDPR will be around for a period of time. But my hope would be, from the perspective of European regulators as well, they, they see these agreements as the vehicle to try to achieve both of our ends. And there's not a lot of point in having extensive uh, litigation and building precedent for a world in which we hope the issue will, over time, start to go away. Well, that's an excellent segue to the panel, too, certainly. So but we do have a few minutes for questions. So I want to see if folks have questions and start with Eric. So, uh, Wait, we have a microphone, I think, coming by for the benefit of our streaming audience. Thank you. Uh, Eric Wenger from Cisco. Um, given what, what you were just saying, David, about the fact that, uh, that we have uh, a significant amount of uncertainty, um, especially until these executive agreements come into place, and then given what Kelly was saying about the, the, what she views as being a significant risk of uh, continued conflict between the GDPR and the Cloud Act, do, do any of the panels think that there is uh, any remaining piece of the litigation that is being sought to be dismissed right now that remains relevant on a going forward basis? I know that some parts of the, the dispute which turn on whether or not the, the Congress intended for the law to have an extraterritorial reach clearly have been answered. But other issues that seem to have been teed up in the, in the litigation about whether or not there is a, a conflict of law between our systems or whether or not providers should have a mechanism under common law to be able to uh, appeal to the courts seem to have some ongoing relevance, particularly in this, in this period of, of transition. Um, so, uh, and I note that DOJ has asked not only for the case to be dismissed as moot at the Supreme Court, but for the Second Circuit decision to be wiped off the books as well too. And then the, uh, Microsoft uh, uh, has yesterday, I believe, agreed to that on the condition that the, the district court case uh, would be wiped out as well too, is that right? So, uh, so the, the, both parties seem to be trying to wipe all the decisions off the, the uh, books at a time where there remains some uh, uncertainty. Do, do, you, do, do all the panelists agree that the, those cases have no relevance anymore or there's some piece of that that should be allowed to remain? Uh, 
Does so, that mean you have to give back all your billable hours? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you, can, you, can direct that, you can direct that question to Hasa. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the key question. The next panel. Right. Um, so Alex, do you want to handle that in terms of what are, what are the, so I guess issues that are sort of in the background of the Microsoft case that might not have been the ones that were teed up for the question presented in the Supreme Court, but that are still live? And to, to pick out one, for example, <laughs> when can a provider move to Quash? Do they have to wait till they're in contempt? Or can they move as they would under 2703H when the warrant comes in and they realize there's a risk of, of, of conflict. Those sorts of open questions, what, do you, what are the next ones that are going to be litigated, or at least, at least negotiated in the shadow of whatever that common law is? Yeah, it's a good question. And you, know, you never know what, what, the court, um, what issues the court would focus on in a decision. Um, I think that the, the perspectives of the parties and the Second Circuit decision itself um, were, were pretty narrow and binary. Um, the, the, the Second Circuit decision was narrowly focused on the, quote, focus of this particular provision that has now been amended, which is the legal standard through which the court has uh, instructed lower courts to analyze the presumption against extraterritoriality, which, which is, you know, Eric, this is the legal standard that was at the center of the Microsoft case. And the question about legal conflicts, to your point about that, uh, from our perspective, that question is a different one from the question of the sort of conflict that would trigger a comedy analysis. Our, our argument all along in the litigation was that for purposes of the presumption against extraterritoriality, namely the question of whether you should analyze this particular provision of the Stored Communications Act as having extraterritorial effect or not, you don't need to analyze whether there's a conflict. All you need to analyze is whether there's the presence of international friction that shows that foreign countries are concerned about this extraterritorial application of US law. And our view was that was, that was manifest. I think um, the analysis of whether there is a, a sufficient conflict to trigger a comedy analysis is a different question that the Second Circuit didn't address. And, um, neither party really raised in their brief. So I think the vacator of the Second Circuit decision won't really set the law back in terms of the circumstances when a provider can bring a comedy analysis. That's my yeah. take, at least. I'll, and I'll nominate one other one, which I thought was very interesting, the DOJ motion to moot the Second Circuit opinion in particular, to wipe out the Second Circuit opinion, which was that the Second Circuit's opinion spoke more broadly in terms of the Stored Communication Act's extraterritorial reach and didn't focus solely on 2703's affirmative reach for law enforcement purposes to data. That is to say, the Second Circuit opinion at a minimum assumed, and the parties, at least Microsoft, certainly argued that the data protection provisions of the Stored Communications Act only reach within the United States borders and do not reach data stored abroad even by US provider. And that's an area where different providers have taken different positions and where there has not been a lot of case law and it hasn't caught that much public attention. But that's an area where the DOJ said that, that reach of the extraterritorial reach of the privacy provisions of American law also ought not be decided by an opinion that has now been mooted. And so that may be an area for future litigation or at least debate going forward. Yeah, that's a good point. So another question over here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Jorge Carrera, legal counsel at the Embassy of Spain. Uh, just a bit of clarification, if you allow me. Um, it has been said, uh, if I understood well, that the GDPR uh, could uh, even make a little bit difficult uh, the transfer of data from the Europe to the United States. I would say, I think I'm, we are mostly right now talking about uh, law enforcement data transfer and criminal justice data transfer. Uh, when it comes to this kind of data, it's the new directive who mainly rules and not the GDPR. So, and if you take the directive, please uh, have a look at basically articles 36, 37, and 38. Uh, there are many avenues that made possible transfer from European Union to the US. So adequacy decision is one. Uh, uh, specific safeguards is another one. But finally, in absence of all of this, Article 38 allows for different cases, in many different cases, for transfer of data. So not just legitimate interest, but uh, an important threat to public security, which goes far beyond the case of emergency cases in the US, as you understand that. And it allows as well specific transfers for the defense or supporting individual claims in the area of criminal justice. So I would say, bottom line, 
as a member of the Spanish judiciary, I, don't, I do not see right now a major difficulty in order to make possible transfer of data in a criminal process uh, from the European Union to the US as it works right now. Frankly speaking, if there is a reasonable cause and it, if there is a resolution of, the, of any judge at the European Union, I don't see with the current, the new directive, which as you know, came together with the data protection regulation. So the package is the data protection regulation and a specific directive for the area of criminal justice of law enforcement. On the basis of this new directive, I don't see major difficulties for the transfer of data from the European Union to the United States uh, in the area of uh, criminal justice and law enforcement. And so I'll, I'll go to Kelly for that for a quick reaction, as I say, because Kelly, so obviously, General Block represented the Commission as an amicus in the Microsoft case and just yeah. some of the similar provisions in the GDPR. Do you want to comment a little bit about whether there would be avenues for transfer based on public safety interests? I, I think there are, but I think certainly, and I would say I'm, I did not draft the brief, the amicus brief on behalf of the Commission. Um, I, I read it with interest. Um, but I, as I read that um, amicus brief, the Commission very clearly wants to um, support the international transfer of data to uh, assist with law enforcement and assist with criminal justice. Um, but certainly my reading of it, and it's just, I'm speaking in a personal capacity here now, is that they want that done through proper channels. They want that done through the MLAT process. They want that done through um, international assistance, whether that's you know the DOJ going to the serious fraud office in the UK and asking for the data to be obtained by the SFO and have that come back through the gateways. That, that certainly, I think, would be encouraged. I think I, I personally draw a slight distinction where you have... Um, a warrant that's just coming straight from the US to Microsoft in London or Microsoft in Dublin, um, and they are being asked to push the data back to the DOJ. Um, but I totally uh, take the, the questioner's point. It's, it's an open um, topic, and um, I think there are a lot of divergent views, certainly, that I've read um, on this particular case. So, I think we're out of time for our first round. I'll, I'll, yeah, I think we're out of time for the first panel, but we'll have quite time for questions in the second panel as well. So I want to thank all three panelists for contributing to something that's 11 days old <laughs> with very mature and thoughtful opinions about it already. And so, and so thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thanks, Steve.
morning, everybody. Um, thank you um, again for, for being here, um, and thank you to CSIS for hosting, and thanks to the panelists um, on the first panel for really enlightening us and um, talking about the really complex and interesting issues with respect to um, the first part of the Cloud app, the reach of U.S. law enforcement warrants. Um, I, we are here to talk about the second part of the, of the Cloud Act, which deals with the um, possibility of the executive branch entering into executive agreements with partner foreign nations that would facilitate foreign governments' ability to access communications content that is U.S. held on a reciprocal basis, also entitling the United States to, to, um, to, to do the same. Um, so I am going to briefly, very, very briefly, introduce the panelists um, and then launch into this um, in the hopes that we can have a really interesting discussion and leave some time for questions at the end as well. Um, to my immediate left, I have Richard Downing, who's the acting deputy attorney. The ridiculously long title in the room. <laughs> Acting Deputy Assistant Attorney General. <laughs> for, for the Department of Justice um, with real expertise in cyber and criminal um, enforcement. Um, to his immediate left is um, Senior Attorney at Microsoft, Hassan Ali. Um, he um, handles national security and law enforcement issues at Microsoft and he also comes to uh, us with um, years of experience working at the Judiciary Committee in Congress. So brings important Hill experience as well. And to um, his immediate left, um, last but certainly not least, we have Kevin Adams from the home office of the UK Embassy to, to represent the UK <laughs> perspective on this as well. Um, so I'm going to start by asking Richard um, to tell us a little bit, to provide a little bit of the overview about how these executive agreements um, um, would be structured and a little bit of the, the background as to what the legislation looks like. Um, again, once, once countries enter into these executive agreements, there's an interaction with the first panel as well because those countries become qualifying countries for the purposes of being able to raise statutory comedy, comedy claims as well. Thank you. And thanks very much to CSIS for putting on this event and for uh, inviting me to speak. Um, uh, this is um, a, a complex issue, as I'm sure you uh, understand from the first uh, panel, and the second part of the act that we're discussing now has interactions with the first part, but is really somewhat distinct in, in the purpose of it. The way I find that it's most easy to think about this, um, the, the, the goals of it and how it would work, is to make sure we have firmly in mind the sort of paradigm case of why um, this was something that was uh, discussed and now implemented, and that is, uh, imagine a investigation in London of a murder, and you have the victim in London, you have the suspect in London, you have the search of the house in London, the search of the victim's phone, and uh, all of these activities are happening under UK law, and suddenly they come across the need for electronic evidence of the person's Facebook account. That data happens, let's say, to be stored in the United States. Um, and through uh, what is normally a purely investiga uh, domestic investigation and what 10 years ago would have been completed completely within the UK, suddenly needs to have the assistance of uh, the United States under the MLAT process in order to get evidence relevant for that case. Why is that a problem? The key problem here is that MLATs are 20th century legal process that have not um, been able to uh, work in the way that cross-border investigations and cross-border data access is necessary today. Um, the uh, slowness, in particular, of mutual legal assistance process is uh, debilitating. And in fact, um, although we are working to improve that uh, response time for requests from foreign countries within my department, which handles those requests, um, there is still a many months long delay. And that's probably an unacceptable delay um, for them as it is for us in the reverse case when we seek information from, let's say, Ireland, which reports a 14 to 18 month delay in turning around investigative requests from the United States. So how do we deal with this? Um, there's one more factor here, and that is what we talked about on the first panel, a lot of the conflicts of law. Um, why can't the UK simply serve its legal process on Microsoft and say, give us the data, we don't care where it's stored, um, and the, the reaction of Microsoft and the other providers has been, we are worried about violating US privacy laws, and therefore we can't simply provide it to you 
for risk of being in a conflict situation. Of course, add one more factor, the UK and other countries with legitimate public safety needs are worried to the point that they can't solve their cases and protect their citizens. They might say, Microsoft and all the other providers, you're storing your data here now because we can't tolerate this slow process of um, uh, obtaining evidence, sometimes called data localization. And then finally, the overlay on all this is how does um, privacy and civil liberties play into this debate? So um, the second uh, part of the, of the Cloud Act is designed to try to address this kind of situation by allowing bilateral agreements between the United States and a foreign government um, and ones who are like-minded in our legal systems and the way that we approach privacy and civil liberty questions. And if that agreement has been executed, um, and if the investigation falls within the scope of the agreement, then US privacy laws, any barriers that are there will be dropped, and UK legal process would be effective and can be served directly on US providers for data stored here. So that's the sort of general notion is, let's come up with a set of investigations with a particular set of countries where we have the same kinds of rules um, where we will agree not to allow, uh, not to block any uh, transfer of that evidence in order for the UK to solve crimes that are happening in the UK. So how does this play out? Um, the, 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 uh, the Cloud Act creates a very um, specific and extensive set of rules about what countries we could enter into these kinds of agreements with. And I put them into two buckets. The first bucket is the kinds of legal system that um, must be present in the foreign country. And they um, are the kinds of uh, general principles like protection from arbitrary and unlawful privacy invasions, fair trial rights, freedom of expression, basic civil liberties kinds of concepts that are necessary um, for us to be able to satisfy ourselves and uh, the citizens of the United States that there are privacy and civil rights respecting rules in place. And then the second bucket is a particular set of rules that would have to be present when the foreign government issues legal process in order to gain, to directly serve it on Microsoft or Facebook or Google, whoever it might be. And those rules have to assure a certain fairly robust baseline of uh, protections um, that are in place. So um, although the words probable cause are not mentioned anywhere, there, are, there is an uh, encapsulation in fairly neutral language that basically gathers that idea. It's not identical to probable cause, uh, but it's articulable and credible facts and particularity. Um, the idea here is to try to find um, a set of principles that are similar to the ones that we use, but not identical. It couldn't possibly be identical. In fact, few countries have as strong protections against government access as the United States does. There also has to be review and oversight by a court. Um, the uh, request can't infringe freedom of speech. Um, if it's a wiretap, it has to uh, be for a fixed duration, and there has to be a, it's an, an item of last resort. You have to have tried other things first. So there's a set of rules which cabin the kinds of orders that would be appropriate for use under the Act. And then there's a, a set of other sort of background safeguards as well. Um, it has to be a serious crime. It can't be jaywalking and uh, something trivial. It's got to be a significant crime. Um, the foreign request cannot target U.S. persons. So the idea here is, look, if it's all just the paradigm case of the U.K. murder, suspects in the U.K., really the U.S. sovereignty interest in protecting access to the data is rather low. It's just chance that the data is stored here and not in the U.K. or Ireland or Zimbabwe. However, if a U.S. citizen is involved, as a target or an account holder, for example, suddenly that's not necessarily the case. Indeed, our sovereignty becomes higher and would not apply, uh, this act would not apply in that kind of situation. And there are other safeguards built into the system too. Um, it's, uh, we can't uh, use this as an end run. US law enforcement, go talk to our friends at the Serious Crime Agency and ask them to make a request back because we'd rather use their standard rather than ours, forbidden under the act. Um, and there are a number of rules which we can get into in a little further as well uh, surrounding um, auditing of the process to make sure that both parties are doing what they said they're doing under the agreement. 
So um, I'm, I've gone on a little long, but um, I think that I hope that gives you sort of an idea of what's going on here. It's uh, uh, designed to solve a particular set of important problems, um, but it's built with an enormous uh, set of safeguards and protections to make sure that it's being done properly and done in appropriate kinds of situations uh, that protect the rights of Americans as well as um, benefit the needs of uh, foreign governments who um, need to be able to protect their own citizens from crime and terrorism. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. So, um, Hassan, as, as Richard just, as, as just laid out, so under, under current law, the same statute that's at issue in, in the first part of the Cloud Act currently prohibits foreign governments from making direct requests to companies for, for stored communications content, and all those requests currently go through the mutual legal assistance process. Um, once these executive agreements are in place, if when there are, when there are uh, currently there aren't any executive agreements in place, but if and when there are executive agreements in place, then those foreign governments will go directly to Microsoft and other companies to make requests for that data. Why, from Microsoft's perspective, is that is that a good thing? Why is that a step forward? And what do you view your role as in terms of ensuring that this long list of privacy compliant requirements are in fact complied with? Yeah, so um, I guess I would say a couple of things. I think first, uh, from a law enforcement national security perspective, right, we view our role here as, as Microsoft and the other providers, not to frustrate law enforcement, but to enable law enforcement to investigate serious crime, to enhance public safety, but under clear legal precepts. So the first point is, you know, the, the framework that Richard just described enables us to do that and it enables law enforcement to get access to the data that they actually do need to solve serious crime and protect not only their citizens but our customers as well. Uh, the second point is that, you know, as we've said throughout the litigation, our customers have an interest in having their own laws and their own governments decide what protections apply to them. And I think that these agreements facilitate that. One, you know, as Richard mentioned, the agreements actually do enhance, have the ability to enhance international privacy laws, enhance government's ability to reform their own laws, right, and to bring them up to standards uh, that incorporate judicial review, that incorporate rule of law aspects, uh, that incorporate narrow and specific surveillance orders. So in that respect, our customers are getting the benefits of countries actually being incentivized to look at their own laws and reform them in light of the, the new digital environment that we're in. And the second point is, uh, or excuse me, related to that, is that these citizens now have their own governments deciding what data protection uh, uh, precepts apply and protect their own citizens. Um, in terms of our role in the process, you know, I think uh, one thing is, I think we should make clear is that these agreements are going to be negotiated between governments, and that's what. Microsoft has been saying all along, right? When we first brought our case, uh, we raised a, a specific legal issue and our larger problem related to conflict of laws, but we've consistently said that litigation is not the ultimate answer. Policymakers and governments must come together and must cooperate in what the ultimate rules of the road are going to be. Uh, so when these agreements are hopefully in place, our role is going to be consistent as what it is now, which is to examine legal process to make sure it follows the applicable law and make sure that it follows the terms of the bilateral agreements that it incorporates human rights protections and is consistent with our, with our policies. And then where necessary to raise a legal challenge, either under a conflicts of law issue or under the domestic law of these individual countries where we believe that legal process was either overbroad or issued uh, under um, the kind of a, a a looser legal regime than we would like. Thank you. So, um, so Kevin, you've, um, it, I think it's no secret that um, the UK has been very interested in, in having um, the, the availability of these types of executive agreements, and it's been reported in the press now for a couple of years that there's been a draft agreement in the works between the UK and the United States, but that agreement could only go into effect if and when this legislation was passed, um, and um, so, so Kevin, can you talk about why this is so important to the UK and what you see as the next steps from the UK's perspective? Sure, so, um, so this is really important. Um, I mean, just firstly, the, the first part of the Cloud Act, which uh, sort of resolves the Microsoft Island case, that's also quite important uh, for us too, because our, the sort of proper functioning of, of the MLAT system requires uh, Stored Communications Act, sort of US domestic warrants to be able to work 
uh, too. And even with the executive agreements in place, there is, um, you know, MLATs are going to continue to be important and there will be a role for them. So we're, we're happy with that. Uh, but you're right, we have been, uh, it has been a, a, real, a particular priority of the UK government for some time uh, for there to be a resolution to this cross-border data problem. And for a, for a couple of years, we have been um, working with, with colleagues on a sort of bilateral agreement or a framework approach of, of bilateral agreements. Um, I mean, this has been a particular priority for our, for our Prime Minister, who is, who is Home Secretary, um, led a real overhaul of the UK's uh, domestic investigatory powers uh, regime. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that. But this, um, the sort of inability of, uh, U of US providers to provide data felt like the sort of, mis the sort of missing piece of the uh, uh, sort of data access system. Um, so we, we have been uh, and sort of trumping that. Um, why is it so vital? Well, I mean, Richard has sort of described the, the sort of situation pre-Cloud Act, um, whereby uh, UK law enforcement can't, uh, um, uh, UK, US providers say that they, ca they cannot comply with UK warrants um, because, of the, uh, because of a conflict of laws. Um, and so, you know, that just leads to sort of absurd sort of scenarios that, again, which Rich has already uh, described. Um, but this is, we have, this is really important, and we have been feeling the importance of this over the last few years even more because um, these are not sort of hypothetical or sort of, you know, philosophical problems. These are sort of real world problems. The UK has had a number of terrorist attacks in the last, over the last year. Um, we've seen real big and challenging rises in serious crimes such as uh, sexual exploitation online. Um, and cases where it is uh, sort of electronic evidence is absolutely key. Um, not just to prosecuting, but to actually intervening and preventing that harm from happening. Um, and that is what law enforcement obviously focused on. So this, um, this has been absolutely vital, and the consequences of not being able to access this data have been real uh, too. I mean, the crimes are going effectively uninvestigated or unresolved as a result. Security agencies uh, are able to provide less assurance than they would because they're not able to um, to intercept communications of, of terrorist suspects uh, in the UK or moving in and out of the UK. Um, and as a result, we've had to do a number of other measures, some of them f you know, much more illiberal, like putting more intrusive surveillance on targets to, to, provide, that re to provide that reassurance. Um, so, I mean, three weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, I was on a panel, uh, a, you know, a bit like this, talking about what the consequences would be if Cloud Act, uh, if Cloud Act doesn't pass. Um, and we were talking very seriously then about, about the unsustainability of that situation and the consequences would be um, you know, serious reviews of whether uh, data localization is required or companies need to build infrastructure uh, in, uh, in other countries in order to be able to comply with warrants, potentially enforcement action against companies. Um, so I think what, what Congress has done now has created basically a pathway, an alternative pathway uh, to resolve these, this conflict and for countries that meet the standards to get the data. Um, so we are very happy. We think that was absolutely the right thing to do. Um, and clearly the next step is to, is to negotiate and conclude a executive agreement and then that to go through the, the process laid out in the Cloud Act before it can come into force. Great. Thank you. So so as, as, as we've just heard, I mean, it, it's at least as has been reported, the agreement with the UK is probably the farthest along than any other um, possible agreements. And um, as, as Richard laid out, once the agreement is, if there is an agreement that's finalized, it will be submitted to Congress and then there's a six month waiting period. But obviously, as we've talked about, there's a number of reasons why these agreements are important, not just to the UK, but to other foreign governments as well. And the incentives in favor of data localization don't just exist within the UK, they exist elsewhere as well. Um, so what's ne who's next? How do we, how do we, who do we think about what other countries might be um, countries that the United States um, will start entering into negotiations? How do you prioritize? How do you think about this? How do we deal with, I mean, particularly we just heard about the serious conflicts with the EU, so it seems like that, dealing with that should be high on, on everybody's agenda. Uh, 
I think that uh, there's a lot of uh, open questions here, and uh, because of the newness of the act, and we are still, of course, uh, in the process of thinking through this question. But uh, yes, it's it's very much the case that we are interested in spreading um, out and making this a wider framework. Um, I think, though, uh, in terms of trying to categorize countries, as I mentioned, the the rules that are in the Cloud Act are quite stringent. Um, and that so uh, it is entirely the case that there will be some countries that more or less kind of um, are ready to sign up for it and meet all of the restrictions or the rules that are there. There are some countries that are very far away from that and are probably in a category that you shouldn't expect that anytime soon. And there may be some sort of in a middle category too who might, with some changes made to their system, uh, become uh, eligible under the, the, the rules that Congress has set out. Um, I would note even that the UK has made changes to its law in order to um, assure itself that uh, it is uh, in a position to be a partners with us under the, the rules that are in the Cloud Act itself. Um, I also think that um, it's likely that we will, um, as, we, uh, as has been pointed out, um, very likely to be working through a lot of issues uh, and resolving issues as we work through it with the UK. Um, and that that will, uh, I hope, facilitate uh, much rap more rapid progress in other places because we will have a template to work from and um, have, I think, uh, sort of uh, given it a road test to a degree. Um, we are very interested, though, and have had a lot of outreach from other countries asking, um, interested in the, that this question of whether they, uh, uh, whether we'd be interested in working with them to negotiate one of these sorts of agreements, and it's going to have to be uh, worked out in the next uh, weeks and months to uh, to figure out a, a more specific answer to that question. And and just on just to follow up on that, I mean, when a country comes to you and says we're interested, is there is there currently or is there going to be some sort of internal process to evaluate? You know, how do we go about evaluating whether these countries meet these standards, and what kind of dialogue? Do you have with the country to say, like, you're close, but you need to change these five things, and then maybe we come back and talk to us? Mm -hmm. Well, um, there are two things I would offer there. Um, the first is um, I would uh, encourage other countries who are interested in doing um, an agreement of this sort to take a look at their legal system and see how uh, the answer to some of these questions about um, the, the restrictions we, of course, would have to, at the conclusion of an agreement, file something with Congress explaining why it is that the other country has met these stringent rules. And so um, having um, a way of explaining to uh, the people who would be on our side of the negotiation um, the aspects of um, your legal system that we wouldn't necessarily know or understand off the bat uh, would be particularly useful. Um, the second uh, thing I would say here, um, no, I've lost my train of thought. Uh, evaluating countries. How do I think about that? Um, operations within DOJ to do that. Oh, sorry. More coffee is necessary here. <laughs> um, there is a process uh, that the US government uses for all sorts of treaties and executive agreements, which um, is uh, used in order to um, make sure that needs and uh, uh, equities of various agencies within the, the, uh, the uh, federal government are taken into account. Um, that, I would expect, would be the kind of process that would be run here when um, uh, we are beginning that uh, question. We would then have to take steps within that existing system to say, yes, indeed, Canada is the next one that we would like to work on. And uh, there would be, there is already a process for working through the question of, um, is that appropriate? Are there equities there that need to be taken into consideration? Should it not be done? Should it be done? Those sorts of questions. So um, I, it's this. Uh, obviously, there's a, a, a very many different kinds of treaties and whatnot. Um, this will fall into um, an established practice uh, when it comes to uh, figuring out, uh, formally figuring out the answer to that question. So if I could just add a couple of thoughts from an outside perspective. Um, perspective, right, because we're not going to be part of the, the governments that are negotiating this. I think there's the, a practical issue that certain governments just aren't ready and aren't, you know, they're, uh, to engage in the bilateral agreement negotiation process, um, both uh, from a logistical perspective, there are only so many that the Department of Justice can do at any given time. Um, but then there's also the, the long-term uh, 
incentives for these bilateral agreements, which is, from my perspective, the real promise of the agreements themselves. There are many countries that I would see that you know, meet some of the human rights standards and everything else, but don't necessarily meet the requirements under their domestic digital privacy and protection laws. And that's not for want of uh, wanting to do these reforms in their laws, but they simply haven't looked at it, right? So these agreements and the legislation itself gives an incentive for these countries to go back, look at their own domestic law, and elevate them to what we would consider you know, a baseline global norms that include both judicial review and opportunity for oversight. Um, and this has the, you know, the, the ability to elevate all boats right, in the international environment, even while these international agreements are pending. Great, that's helpful. Um, Hassan, just to, turning back to you for one for a moment, um, you know, when, when, these, when the, this legislation, this concept was first kind of introduced more formally, there were, there were bills that were sent up from first the Obama administration and then the Trump administration to Congress that basically laid out more or less the framework that was adopted. But one of the key differences between what was ultimately adopted in those earlier versions was that there's an explicit role for Congress. Yeah. Um, and so in the earlier versions, the executive agreements would be entered into by the executive branch, and then that was it. It was done. And now there's an 180-day waiting period where Congress has an explicit role in reviewing and overseeing the elements of the agreement. How do you, how do you see Congress's role playing out during that time period? Uh, that's very much an open question. <laughs> I think, um, you know, putting on my con old congressional hat from kind of an institutionalist perspective, I think one thing that I would hope to see is Congress taking these agreements seriously, right? We have the first US-UK agreement that's going to be uh, sent over to Congress in a few months, hopefully. Um, and there's an opportunity for Congress to get more information, uh, to actually study the agreements themselves. Um, and put some thought into this. There's an expedited you know, voting procedure. I kind of went, I was telling these guys, I looked over the bill last night and tried to make sense of how the procedural rules work, so I couldn't quite understand it, because uh, I'm not a parliamentarian, but at the same time, what the intent there is to facilitate congressional review. And Congress has an important role to play if they want to play it, right? And um, as these agreements uh, come down the pike, I think it's important to set a tone very early on in the process with the US-UK agreement to, to consider the agreement itself, um, read the explanations that the DOJ is gonna provide and why the UK meets the human rights standards. I'm sure that's gonna be very tricky um, to meet, but uh, we're gonna see how much Congress actually cares in, in, in the next uh, six to eight months. Um, and I think that's gonna be an important signal to the rest of the world and to the privacy community and to the tech community, right? Because I think we're all relying on Congress to, um, as part of our system of checks and balances, uh, to look at how these agreements are structured, what countries uh, are in the quote unquote club, um, and what protections exist, not only for US persons, but for persons across the world. So, so Kevin, turning to you for a moment, one of the, I think one of the most interesting and innovative aspects of these agreements is that they require ongoing compliance reviews. Um, Richard mentioned this um, in, in, his, in his first statements, but um, the, every country that enters into this agreement um, is required pursuant to the legislation to agree to um, certain types of compliance by the U.S. and, and um, so, and that's, that's a sea change. So under the current mutual legal assistance process, once there's a determination that the data is turned over to a foreign government, there's no ongoing role for the United States, no explicit ongoing role for the United States to figure out how that data is being used. This is new. Um, so I'm wondering how the UK, UK sees this and, and what, what thought has been given into how that would work and what kind of access um, US officials would have. Yeah, so I mean, I think there's a pretty big caveat that we haven't we, you know, we haven't agreed exactly what that looks like. We haven't um, uh, sort of finalized agreement or, or laid out in that, in that detail. But uh, I can say we are uh, entirely comfortable and committed to, um, to sort of monitoring and reporting standards that, uh, that meet or even exceed the, the particular requirements that uh, Justice and uh, Department sort of places on us in, in the agreement. Um, so a big caveat, we don't know exactly. We haven't decided exactly what it's going to look like. Um, I can say uh, a little bit about how we are thinking that we in the UK are going to be sort of monitoring uh, compliance with this. And uh, broadly speaking, um, we are already implementing changes to our, actually highly significant changes to our domestic investigatory powers framework 
the Investigatory Powers Act created a, a sort of powerful new office, the Investigatory Powers Commissioner's Office. And the Investigatory Powers Commissioner is, a, um, is one of our most sort of senior judges, an entirely independent with much sort of greater resources and powers at his um, or her, it's currently a he, uh, at sort of disposal to, um, to investigate. And this, his powers include audit and oversight of uh, public authorities' access to and use of data, including their compliance to um, non-statutory policies and, and guidance, such as those that will be put in place in the agreement. So what I mean is we are currently throes of putting major, major change and uh, much more uh, sort of rigorous oversight powers and broadly speaking we in the UK will make sure that there's sort of layers of, 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 of compliance. So firstly individual agencies um, and departments that uh, have the ability to make requests for data um, will have to commit to and demonstrate that they're able to comply with whatever, is, whatever the terms are in, in the agreement. Uh, those in department, departments and agencies of course have their own internal sort of compliance uh, and monitoring rules and requirements to report errors. Um, and we will, um, and it is sort of our current intention to, uh, to include within the investigatory power commissioners uh, sort of explicit responsibilities, um, that sort of independent um, or sort of authorized uh, monitoring and auditing and compliance checking of our um, sort of use of the agreement specifically. So, I mean, that is currently how we are going about thinking. The most, essentially, the most um, uh, sensible and sort of rigorous way to sort of really bake uh, this in is to make it part of our sort of domestic, integral part of our domestic oversight uh, requirements. So that, that's our current, uh, that's our plan. But again, to caveat, we haven't. This is the, amongst the sort of details um, that we haven't we haven't finalised yet. So Richard, let me ask the same question to you. Um, how is the US government thinking about how these types of reviews or audits might, might work? Um, I don't mean to be a broken record here, but I would uh, echo some of uh, Kevin's comments that this is not something that we have um, any finality on. Uh, we are definitely looking at that question of how to um, assure that uh, when the UK auditors come over here to, to look at our books, we're uh, making sure that we have done all the right things and are following the rules properly. Um, of course, we are, as was pointed out in the earlier panel, in a slightly difficult situation because um, uh, we may well see uh, state and local warrants that want to comply or want to use this process in order to obtain compliance from uh, foreign providers or providers storing data overseas and how exactly that will work is still up in the air. But likely we will have to have some sort of centralization of the process um, uh, to make sure that uh, we are fully apprised of what is going on all around the country and to make sure that it is indeed uh, following the rules that are set out in the agreement. Uh, but it's still very much a work in progress. So I think for anybody who's, who kind of followed the debate leading up to the, um, to the enactment of the Cloud Act was um, probably aware that there was a lot of concerns raised by, by privacy groups. Um, and Hassan, um, you mentioned earlier that you view this as a privacy win in some ways, or that's yeah, why I absolutely. understood you, you, what you to be saying in the sense that it incentivizes foreign governments to meet the standards laid out in the law. So I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how you think about the, the privacy effect of, of this legislation. Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, from a status quo perspective, right, um, given the law enforcement frustrations that both Richard and, and Kevin have mentioned from law enforcement across the world, we are seeing the providers, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, uh, all of us are seeing um, very aggressive tactics by law enforcement in foreign jurisdictions, especially ones that don't actually have a very good human rights record or very good domestic surveillance law um, or data protection uh, laws in place. So one of the things that this bill does is it actually um, sets forth kind of a, a concrete framework uh, and incentivizes them to go and reform their laws, um, to elevate their standards, meet the human rights conditions, even if that is long term, and join the, the club in order to enhance their law enforcement capabilities. So, um, you know, one of the things that we've heard consistently from, from privacy groups is, I think, I would generally categorize, that, categorize them as, as three major concerns. 
Um, the first one was on the congressional review piece, which was uh, a lot of that was addressed in changes made to the legislation before it went to the omnibus bill. Uh, the second, the biggest category, in, from my perspective, is that the bill didn't have strong enough protections, right? It wasn't perfect enough, right? So it didn't actually explicitly ask for probable cause. It actually had uh, a more broad standard that where foreign governments could parallel that type of um, that legal regime. And I think the bill itself, if you look at the bill, if you study the bill, uh, it has these baseline requirements that are quite stringent. So you, it does require judicial review and oversight. It does require narrow and specific surveillance requests. It does require First Amendment protections uh, and rule of law protections built into these legal regimes. And these are important, right? And these are actually significant steps forward when you go and study the domestic surveillance laws of a lot of foreign countries, including many in the, in the European Union. Um, so from that perspective, this bill is a significant step forward in the larger global debate on what our privacy laws should look like, right? even if it doesn't meet the highest threshold. Um, and I think the, the third category is the, the real-time surveillance issue. Uh, and you know, one of the things that the Cloud Act does is that it does lower the barriers for real-time uh, surveillance requests. And I think you know, that is just a larger question from my perspective on how we envision uh, our, our, how we balance the privacy interests between real-time surveillance and stored surveillance. I think that equation has specifically flipped actually in the past couple of decades. You know, I would say that you know, law enforcement getting access to my Gmail or Outlook account for in, you know, back 20 years, it's much more privacy intrusive than a real-time surveillance request. So I'm not actually, you know, taking sides in the debate, but I think it's one that we have to have, and it's not as easy as we'd like to, to make it out to be as it was in the 1980s when we were dealing with um, you know, traditional telephony. Thanks, I mean, I think, I, I think one of the, um, just to jump in for one second, I think that one of the you know, interesting dilemmas or, or issues in designing a piece of legislation like this is this desire to establish sufficiently high standards but recognize that there's variation amongst the world. And if you try to replicate the US standard, you're basically ex trying to export US standards around the world in ways that just both don't fit the domestic systems of foreign governments. And also, to some extent, um, if you make standards unachievable, then you don't achieve right. any of the benefits that this legislation is meant to achieve. Um, so using that as a, and then I'm going to turn to questions, so think of your questions, but using that as a, as a final question to the panel, um, you know, we've, you talked, Hassan, you use this language and others have talked about this club versus non-club, and do we risk, I mean, if one of the, one of the concerns is that we're trying to um, kind of stave off data localization as a means of, as, a, as the key means of accessing evidence and facilitating um, cooperation across borders and um, facilitating kind of standardization of baseline norms across borders, are we running the risk of having you know, two, two worlds or three worlds um, in this regard? Uh, I guess um, it's an interesting question, but I, from my perspective, don't view this as um, a big worry. Um, first of all, it's to understand that the MLAT process is not going away. It's still going to be needed in a, a number of situations. Um, including, of course, with countries that haven't entered into one of these agreements, but also even with uh, countries that we have these agreements with, if, we, uh, if the United States were indeed targeting a UK person, well then that falls outside of the agreement and would have to be um, handled by uh, more traditional means. Um, but more than that, um, countries that um, are not yet part of an executive agreement are in fact no worse off than they are today. Um, so uh, although, of course, I, as I said, we want to make sure that we are doing our best to sort of put this out there as a broader framework, it's not that they are um, uh, any worse off and in fact may be better off because the mutual legal assistance process, I hope, will be um, uh, less burdened because many more uh, requests can be made directly to the providers, and that will actually ease the system that we have in place now. I'll wait to be seen, of course, but that's, the, that's part of the motivation here, is to see if we can um, open up another channel. Um, not that the old, the old channel is going to go away, but maybe it will get better and, in fact, be a benefit uh, for all sorts of transfers of information. Um, and then finally, um, I do think it is a fair point, though, to say uh, it is uh, definitely going to um, uh, 
uh, potentially create a diplomatic headache for the United States government uh, because there will be some countries that are very much interested in entering into an agreement and we say, look, really sorry, but um, Congress has laid out rules and uh, we don't believe Congress would approve you on this sort of an agreement. Um, and that's not going to be an easy conversation in certain cases. So um, it's an interesting question, uh, though, to raise. And I'm curious if uh, others have uh, views on that as well. Yeah, so um, so we, we believe very strongly in the sort of framework approach. Our focus has been, of course, on the, uh, on the UK and uh, ensuring the changes made for not just have a bilateral agreement. But um, we do believe very strongly in the framework. And there are times in our discussions with with with, uh, with colleagues on the Hill, you know, people have said this is going to be a very difficult framework. Maybe if it was just the UK, it could be done. And we were always very very clear that we felt it was important um, that it was a wider framework for the privacy benefits, for the data localization, uh, or you know, disincentivizing it benefits. But also, I mean, more broadly, it is strongly in all of our interests that that like-minded partner countries, uh, law enforcement and security capabilities are able to deal with the, the sort of threats and challenges facing the countries. And that makes all of us uh, more safe. I mean, we, we believe that our, our partners in, in, in Europe and America will, will see a security dividend of the UK being able to access the data that it needs to, to prevent crime, including terrorism. Questions, yes. Lots of questions. Um, hello, I am so, Hi. Um, I'm Ramin Nkuti from the Embassy of Italy. I have actually two questions, two clarifications to ask you. Um, the first one is regarding the barrier that is the freedom of speech as a limit to, uh, as a standard that has to be met for entering in the executive agreements. How is this really going to play out? In other words, is the freedom of speech going to be assessed um, uh, with an interpretation of the requesting state. In other words, if the requesting state meets certain um, levels of respect of the civil right or human right, or is it going to be assessed with the perspective of the US laws? What we are encountering now as European countries, especially I'm talking about Italy, is that we have difficulty to access data regarding crimes of defamation or opinion. So is this going to change? Is this going to play out in the executive agreements? How is this going to be dealt with? Uh, the second question is um, actually um, regarding the um, uh, differences between qualifying countries, uh, foreign countries, and countries that do not meet the standard to be a qualifying foreign country, but do their executive agreements. Uh, I would like a comment on uh, what, why do you think or how do you think foreign countries might be interested in being a qualifying country or rather an executive, uh, an, uh, country entering just an executive uh, agreement uh, because both, from what I understand, um, uh, allow for a statutory uh, comity uh, analysis. So what would be an interest of a European country to become a qualifying a country or just a country entering an executive agreement with the US? Thank you. I think I can take a, a, a start on that. Um, uh, taking the, the, um, the first question, um, there are two places in the Cloud Act where the freedom of speech arises. The first, I, I think you pointed out, is whether the foreign countries um, in general supports freedom of speech and therefore would be generally eligible to enter into an agreement. And the second place that it enters into is that a particular order in a particular case cannot be used to infringe freedom of speech. Um, to answer that question, uh, I think uh, it's worth pointing out that if you were to line up all the countries of the world on a spectrum of how aggressively they feel about protecting freedom of speech, um, the United States would be on the far end. Um, and that's, I think, reflected in your question that there are defamation laws and others that are criminally um, liable in Italy. And we've had this experience in many different kinds of situations where we get requests from other countries for uh, investigating crimes that would not be a crime and, in fact, protected speech if it were to occur in the United States. So um, to answer the first bucket, 
it can't possibly be that every country has to have our level of overall protection of freedom of speech because I don't think I'm going out of a limb here to say that there are probably zero countries in that category. Um, so it has to be at least a little more flexibly applied as a general matter. And then in the specific, the specific case, um, uh, that is, I think, something that's going to have to be uh, looked at and addressed. Um, uh, in particular, uh, uh, I think uh, one has to recognize that even if it were to be uh, impermissible under the agreement in a particular instance, that doesn't mean that, that everything is off the table. That just means that it has to go back through the MLAT process. Now, you might say, well, that's not very helpful because we know you're going to deny our MLAT request. And the answer is, yeah, that's kind of the point in a way, right? Is that the agreements do not abrogate our responsibilities under the Constitution. And so in, in Congress, and when it passed the act, was in very much intending to apply um, reasonable protections for uh, under the act. Now, um, you know, I think it's uh, still an area, though, that is unexplored and probably will have to be uh, thought through further about how it will actually play out in practice. Um, the second question you had um, had to do with uh, this question of an executive agreement versus a qualifying foreign country. This is an area of um, deep confusion. And as one of the people who was involved in drafting this, um, I apologize now. Um, um, in order to get an agreement, that's the part two of the act that we're talking about. But in order to be a qualifying foreign country, it's only used in the part one of the act. And it has the obligation that there be an agreement in place and other <laughs> steps. And I think David may have laid this out. Uh, there has to be also um, uh, reciprocal laws in place and, and some other restrictions like that. So one question is, um, can you just choose the second part and not be a qualifying foreign country for purposes of the first part? And the answer is, yes, it's entirely possible under the way that it's been drafted. A country could choose to be that. It's more a question of, do they, does the other country have reciprocal laws? And maybe you already have them. Maybe in that sense, it's not a choice about whether to be a qualifying foreign country. It's a matter of a question of, is your legal system um, giving equivalent rights of comedy um, when a provider were to go into the foreign country's court system and ask for relief in the same way that they might under the statutory regime that's laid out in the act in US courts if it were the reciprocal case. So just to so, add one little point to that. So, so I said, so, so yes, you can be, you can enter into an executive agreement, but not being a, not be a qualifying country for the purposes of providers being entitled to make statutory motions to dismiss based on comedy claims. But there's no possibility of being a qualifying country for that without having entered into an executive agreement. And there are two additional protections that apply or that are available when you're a qualifying foreign government. You have, if you have, you know, reciprocal comedy rights available to providers, then you have the equivalent rights under a statutory basis in the United States, which means that if there is a conflict of law or if a legal request from the United States government falls outside the terms of the bilateral agreement, providers are there to act as kind of a, in some sense, an enforcement mechanism that, hey, like we've received this request from the US government. There's a conflict of law that remains with Italy that hasn't been resolved by the bilateral agreement and we're bringing a comedy challenge. There's a second you know, protection that's available on, for qualifying foreign governments, which is notice to the foreign government, notwithstanding a gag order, right? So when we do receive a request, that has an applicable non-disclosure order because of investig proper investigatory reasons, we are nonetheless able to go and tell the Italian government that, hey, we've actually received their request, right? And if you choose to do something about it, then, you, uh, then the government has the ability to do that. Um, so there are incentives that are built into being a qualifying foreign government, but admittedly, it's a very confusing part of the bill, and um, it's, uh, you know, we have to see how that all plays out. Yes, in the back. Hi, my name is John Croft. I'm with Northrop Grumman, but I'm asking in my personal capacity. Um, on this question of qualifying countries, uh, just for the panel, it seems to me this is not really a new concept that actually the EU has had their adequacy regime in place since the 95 directive. And in fact, uh, with the GDPR, they have Article 45, which lists many factors in determining whether a country is adequate to share uh, personal information with. So I'm, I'm just 
suggesting that this seems to be an evolving reciprocal arrangement. I just wondered if there were any reactions from the panel on comparing adequacy with uh, qualifying countries. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, my focus and our focus has been on securing an agreement rather than securing uh, the status of qualifying um, country. But, I mean, to the extent that I think this is part of a broader framework that um, is about removing barriers between like-minded countries and a sort of mutual recognition of standards, I think it's, that's, it's a good thing. And I, I mean, I think there's, it's certainly part of a trend of domestic legislation setting out standards and opining on the adequacy or the sufficiency of other governments' processes and having that affect the ability of data to move. So there's certainly key similarities. There are obviously differences, but there's, there's some important similarities. Somebody has, yes, question number Hi, uh, Eric Wenger from Cisco. Uh, this is a question for Richard. You laid out that there are important protections that are in uh, the part of the law that deal with these inbound requests um, relating to um, limiting their ability to uh, be uh, targeting speech-based crimes or um, to target Americans. Uh, um, either directly or through backdoor searches. I'm just curious what you've, you believe, you hinted to this, there, there's some uncertainty here, but I'm, what do you expect the, the executing mechanism would be like to ensure that those protections are, are meaningfully applied? Uh, that's a good question. Um, there are a couple of uh, ways that this would uh, be assured. Um, on the one hand, um, in the situations where the provider uh, believes that a particular foreign legal process is not within the scope of the agreement, they can raise it with the United States government and there is a provision to uh, basically veto that uh, particular provision. So I don't really expect that that's gonna come up very often. Um, most often I would say the provider maybe um, doesn't have the inside information about the investigation to know one way or the other, but there may be situations where that does come up and both the UK and the US, depending on which way the request is going, reserve the right to uh, basically, um, as an escape valve, say that particular request cannot go through the process of the uh, fall under the agreement and would have to go through a regular MLAT process. Um, the other way that it will come up is through the system of audits. Um, as we talked about, um, each country is committing to um, uh, assure that it is complying and be able to justify it when the other person, uh, the other country comes looking. And in fact, um, we, uh, a, a, another part of the agreement is that every five years uh, that uh, adequacy has to be uh, renewed. And so um, I think, at least from our perspective, we think that that is uh, some significant um, uh, deterrence about playing fast and loose with the rules or doing things that would be in, uh, against the agreement because, of course, um, this agreement, which I think benefits both sides, could uh, be renegotiated or abrogated if the rules are not being followed and everyone isn't satisfied with the way things are going. So I, I do think there are mechanisms built in that, that uh, will um, provide strong incentive to be following the rules. I mean, let me just add, so, so all of that is, is, is true, but there's also a, a huge number of layers that individual requests have to go through before, and if that would be triggered. So, I mean, as part of the agreement, we will be, um, we expect to be agreeing minimization and targeting rules. Um, there would be lots of detailed implementation in the UK, agencies demonstrating that they can, uh, that they understand those and can meet with those to the level of specific pe trained people able to handle it. And I talked a little bit about our uh, oversight and uh, sort of internal orders and mechanisms. All of that sort of applies up through the chain. Uh, we're only talking about warrants here that will go through a sort of double lock, including judicial approval. All of that before the request even sort of gets to the company. And so each of those layers is, was designed to make sure that uh, requests will be in line with the, in line with the agreement. And, but even before you get to the audit process, right, the agreements themselves can specify the type of crime that's applicable under the agreement itself. So if there are specific crimes within uh, a foreign country that relate to defamation or opinion crimes, 
the U.S. government, I, I, I would assume, would kind of isolate those and say, okay, well, those go through the normal channels and they don't fall within the expedited bilateral agreement. So I assume that's another protection that's built into the way that these um, agreements can be structured. So I'm going to take two final questions, um, brief, and then we'll, we'll respond. To, we just have a few minutes left. So if you can both um, ask relatively brief questions, we will respond to the two final questions. So here and here. Yeah, thank you. I wouldn't just ask right now in my personal capacity, but today the cloud tax is law in the United States, and as it is, uh, it can create conflict of laws. So I can imagine the situation in uh, what, uh, for example, a European company who is providing services in the U.S. but has data stored in a, in a European Union server uh, can now be requested in order to uh, deliver those data to uh, the law enforcement or the judiciary in the U.S. So that can bring us into a conflict of laws uh, and, and, and difficult situations. Um, I can imagine that in the future we'll try or we'll find a kind of common ground in order to an understanding in order to make a, a possible and more uh, smooth transfer of that, uh, uh, let's call uh, bilateral agreements, governmental agreements or whatever. But the problem is what happens meanwhile, I mean, during this kind of uh, 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 transitional situation, if you allow me to use the term. So, and my question would be how inclined would be the Department of Justice in order to, how flexible, in order to allow, for example, a common law a committee analysis for those situations? Because we are not still in a bilateral agreement. We are not still a qualified country or a qualified area. We have still to discuss if the European Union can join as a bloc or not. But during this uh, kind of transitional period, uh, uh, how inclined would be the Department of Justice in order to allow a, a kind of solution for those situations that could bring us into uh, tensions that maybe at the end of the day then would be more difficult to, uh, for example, reach bilateral agreements in, in, in the context of the cloud tech? Thank you. And then there's one more question here as well. Thanks a lot. Uh, my name is Peter Surin. I'm from the Russian Embassy. Um, uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank the panel for a very uh, detailed explanation of how the Cloud Act is going to work with those who cl uh, qualified. But uh, listening to all of this, I got uh, the following question. Uh, for, as far as I understand, the main objective of the Cloud Act is to make uh, criminal investigations on serious cases, including terrorism, more effective. Uh, in this regard, don't you think that uh, those criminals in America who got information they would like to, to hide from, from the United States authority, will, they will just uh, request the companies to localize their data in uh, the countries which are not uh, qualified by the United States. And as far as I understand, it's the biggest part of the world. Uh, and in this regard, don't you think that probably data localization will be more effective for the efficiency of, uh, of such kind of investigations? Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, I can take a crack at the first question. Um, and I don't know, perhaps the second too. Um, I think it's important to understand that, um, as was pointed out in the first panel, there has not yet been a, a comedy analysis in terms of uh, the Stored Communications Act or providers um, because there has been no claim brought to date and uh, indeed not even in the Microsoft case uh, in the Supreme Court did any either side allege that there actually was a conflict. Um, so the question of whether this will come up at all will be interesting. Um, and if it does come up, I think it will be because of European action in the GDPR uh, that's creating uh, a, a difficulty. Uh, obviously, uh, we heard uh, experts from the UK on the first panel saying how this is an uncertain area and they have concerns. Uh, but uh, I think we should be very clear that um, if there is a conflict, it isn't being created by US law. Indeed, the Cloud Act restores what we believe was the law all along um, and make sure that a uh, US legal process, like a European legal process, has uh, effect even when the data is stored outside of the, uh, the home country. Uh, 
Um, with respect to the hiding of data, um, I don't want to jump in if you are, would prefer, but uh, I, I guess as far as data localization, I guess I see the desire to localize data should be um, uh, reduced by the fact that U.S. process does have effect outside uh, to data stored outside of the United States, um, because if the reverse were true, then there would be an incentive to keep that data outside of the United States because it would be beyond U.S. legal process. So at least for that piece of the Cloud Act, um, it is uh, runs against the idea of data localization. Um, but to your larger point, um, there is pressure to localize data, of course. Um, in various countries around the world. Um, and uh, I do think, though, that the second part, this uh, executive agreement idea, works against that. It is at least one tool that can be um, used to try to uh, prevent uh, incentives to localize data. Is it a perfect tool? No, I think that's right. There's still going to be um, some countries that feel pressure to do that. Uh, but I hope we're taking at least one step forward in terms of uh, reducing that pressure. So I just had sort of two two quick points. Um, I think, uh, firstly, it does the sort of philosophy of the the Cloud Act, the sort of idea behind it, I think, is is the right one. That countries are um, countries should have the domestic powers to request data that they that they need that meets a certain standard, um, uh, regardless of where it is stored. And then a like-minded country should. Uh, make the effort to ensure that they don't erect barriers that prevent that from, from happening. Um, and that is the right way uh, to do it, and that is the right way to disincentivize uh, data localization. But I think it's also true to say the Cloud Act doesn't solve all of our data problems in all spheres, um, but it is a really important step to resolving what should be the most easy bit to resolve, which is just a sort of conflict of laws that were never designed to create that conflict, but uh, legacies from a sort of pre-internet age getting in the way of practical law enforcement. So we don't see this as solving everything, but it's, um, we think it's a really important step. So with that, please join me in thanking the panel and thanking CSAS.